I want to work through some of this just a moment. Go, go to verse 2. Let's start with that first immediately because there's some stuff in this passage. What I really want to try to do is build the underpinning of this story and build it around he saw their faith. Okay, There's context leading in. There's context leading out. And in the middle there in that great fifth verse was he saw their faith. But verse 2, many gathered together so that they had no room to receive him, not even the door, and he preached the word to them. What is it that he preaches to them? Well, we say, will he preach the word? What's the word? See, I think when we study the Bible, we need to stop and ask ourselves questions like this. You go, well, that's too simple. The word is, you pre- you, when you preach the word to people, you preach good news. You can go to heaven. You don't have to go to hell. Jesus loves you. He died on a cross for you. He rose from the dead. Do you think Jesus preached, he died on the cross for you and he rose from the dead in Mark chapter 2? Good common sense will tell you it's impossible that that's what he preached. Why? He hadn't died on the cross yet. So what's the word? I mean, I know it sounds like a simple question. It is a simple question with a pretty complex answer. Because if I go around and even anonymously and say, okay, you tell me, what is it he's preaching to them? I mean, what's the word? Well, it'd be easy if it was 2018. We'd go, well, I know what the word sounds like. And I've been listening to the word my whole life in church. And we just have to slap a verse on it. Tell a couple of illustrations and a joke, put three scriptures on top of it, and walk out and go, that was the word. I was motivated to live better, or I want to go to heaven when I die, or I believe Jesus loves me. All those things are the word, but I don't think that any of that's what Jesus is preaching. He certainly doesn't come along preaching the cross. He's not dead yet. He can't preach the resurrection. Nobody knows what that's about. What's the word? The word there in the Greek, literally, and that was what was written in, was Greek, not English, was the Greek word logos. And logos is not just what you say, because that's a bit redundant. He preached what he said to them. That wouldn't make a lot of sense. Of course he preached what he said to them. I mean, you don't need to be told that. What did he preach today? Well, he preached. Well, that's not a very good answer. That would mean you weren't listening. <laughs> Maybe there's a few of those in here. Your response at lunch, well, what did the guy preach? I don't know, he preached. Maybe that's more my fault than yours. I'm going to go to work on that. So the word, it's not he preached the word to them, which means he preached out loud to them as opposed to silently. Because the word logos is, is colorful and it's big and it's bold and it's deep. And I think its greatest rendering is, I mean, John 1 opens within the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And what is that word? The word became flesh. It's It's meaning and purpose on the earth. And I think Jesus walks into the room and he does what he always does when he wants to get your attention. He begins to speak to you about your meaning on the earth and your purpose in life and why you are here and who you are and what you're going to do with yourself on the planet. And I think we need to ask people that in the church once in a while. Because we all talk about preaching the word and what we think is that's a guy that gets up, opens his Bible, reads the scripture and then screams for 45 minutes. We get up, play Amazing Grace, a couple people come forward, we pray for him, go eat lunch, go boy the word was good and no one walks out understanding a darn thing about themselves. Well that's not the word. Because no one left with meaning, they just left with a couple of amens. And a rumbly stomach can't wait to go eat a sandwich. And man, if that's all we're going to come together for, I can find better usages of my time, and I think you could too. Jesus goes into them and he preaches the word, meaning Jesus lays out in front of his audience meaning and purpose for being on the earth. And that's worth listening to. And I don't think we think about that enough. Because listen, man, if your purpose is just to get your 40th hour in so your boss pays you, you're miserable. If your meaning on the earth is just to make it to next July because we're going to Disney World, it's a miserable run to July. And the day you take off, you start getting depressed because you're already counting down the day you got to come home. Anybody ever notice that? That's because our purpose and our meaning has been so focused on the temporal that's going to pass away really fast that the moment it starts passing away, we grab hold of it and there's nothing to hold on to. And so finding our meaning and finding our purpose is important. And here's why. Because, listen, walking into this room in a moment are four guys who bring their buddy to see Jesus and their buddy shows no indication of faith, but they do. And he sees their faith and moves on their friend. And I believe they've been hearing the word, the logos, the meaning, and realized that their meaning that day was to get their buddy to Jesus. And that's a pretty good meaning. 
It's way better than getting a paycheck and going to Disney World. It, it's worth something. It's worth tearing off someone's roof, even knowing you may have to pay for it. It's worth crashing the Jesus meeting, even though there's nowhere to crash. It's worth bringing your paralytic friend to Christ, if that's what, if it, the whole purpose in life is to get him there. And when you start to show meaning, you start to impact the world around you. And until you show no meaning, you don't impact the world around you at all. You're shiftless and purposeless. This is what I've started trying to minister in grace communities and in grace churches is, listen, it's wonderful to know that you're the righteousness of God in Christ. You need that information. If you don't have that information, that's ABC. Let's start over. You're God's righteousness because you believed on Jesus, not because you did good things. I mean, if doing good things makes you righteous, then doing bad things would make you unrighteous. How many of you think it would qualify? How many of you think you'd need to do before you'd be unrighteous? Well, how many do you think you needed to do to be righteous? Well, my God, that's an impossible task. You're going to live your whole life trying to hope you just die with one in the good column more than you had in the bad column. That's a miserable existence. That's that whole cross your fingers when you get to the gates and ask Peter if he'll let you in. Foolishness. And why is Peter the one in folklore and legend that gets the gate assignment? Is it punishment or is it a reward? Kind of seems like you get tired of that after a while. I mean, people are dying literally at the rate of every second on the planet. And he's got this endless line of people. No, you know as well as I do that's not scriptural. But we, I, you still got to deal with people's righteousness. So if you need to deal with your righteousness, know that it's yours by faith. But I'm going into grace communities trying to instill meaning into people that meaning is more than making money. Meaning is more than buying a house. Meaning is more than just working to get to a vacation. Meaning has to do with your fellow man. Every time Jesus turns around, he keeps talking about how you treat your neighbor. Well, that tells me that the word rotates around what you do with your neighbor. I mean, it's everything from love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. It's if your neighbor needs you to help him, don't just help the way he needs it, help him more than he needs. It's turn the other cheek when he smites you. It's give a cup of cold water in my name. It's be the good Samaritan to the people that don't like you, not to the people that like you. Jesus said, if you only help the people that like you, how much better are you than a sinner? Even sinners help people that like them. Shouldn't you be a step above that? Help some people that hate your guts? How about helping some people you disagree with? How about helping some people on the other side of the political aisle that you don't like any of their thoughts or philosophies? How about the defining factor in your life not be your political philosophy? How about it be the fact that you're a believer in Christ and that you're a new creation? That might be a good place to start. That's finding a meaning that's bigger than politics and bigger than region and bigger than where you grew up, bigger than who your family is. It's a meaning on the earth that would make a difference in someone's life if you shared it with them.